Everybody, we're going to get started with our, our third panel, um, and the topic is mergers, and I'll turn it over to uh, our moderator, Mr. Alden Abbott from the FTC. Um, thank you so much. Having been duly uh, warned about the quality of work of us in the bureaucracy, the C-plus work, perhaps since the distinguished members of this panel belong to those agencies which merit a C plus, perhaps if they work very hard we may be able to pull it up to a B minus, but we'll see. Uh, I'm Alden Abbott uh, from the uh, uh, FTC, the Deputy Re Director of Office of International Affairs, and like a good bureaucrat I must say the views expressed today are my own and do not necessarily represent the views of the Federal Trade Commission, and, and I'm honored today to have three of the most distinguished uh, commentators on antitrust and on mergers, all of whom have extensive and distinguished government experience. We're going to start out with a presentation by uh, uh, John Baker, who's former, uh, prof he's professor of law at uh, American University, former chief economist uh, at the FTC, also uh, has been involved, uh, also spent time, uh, what, Justice Department? and. Uh, so, and that's not unusual because we, our third speaker, out of order here, uh, Bruce Kobayashi, who's a professor at George Mason Law School, uh, also has experience as a, on the Council of Economic Advisors, Federal Trade Commission, Justice Department. And uh, not to leave out our second distinguished speaker, Tom Hazlitt, professor of law and economics at uh, George Mason Law School, uh, is also has agency experience. He's written a lot on the FCC and on communications information regulation. Not to, not to put it lightly, these gentlemen have written, published prolifically, are outstanding scholars, and they also uh, make me think of California on my mind, that the second and third speakers are what West Coasters would refer to as Bruins. They received PhDs in economics from UCLA. And, uh, and our first speaker uh, went to a junior college, actually to Leland Stanford Junior University for his PhD. So, uh, but in, in, in all seriousness, a very distinguished group uh, and, who, and we're looking forward to their presentation. Let me tee things up very quickly by introducing the uh, merger guidelines. Now, Antitrust analysis of mergers in high-tech industries, it's a truism, but raises difficult questions. I think that's already been pointed out today. And uh, I'm going to briefly talk about what is meant by dynamic versus static analysis, one way of viewing all of this. Because there's, in some circles, there's a trend that, oh, we've got to be very high-tech, think dynamically. Traditionally, the agencies have thought very statically about markets. And I think that my proposition is that's not really quite, quite correct. Yes, we want to think dynamically, but properly understood, I think current merger analysis that the antitrust uh, agencies, federal antitrust agencies, does reflect uh, dynamic uh, an analysis. And uh, so what, what is static analysis? Well, I think one way of looking at it in sort of a static, uh, equilibrium, you focus on competitive conditions in existing markets, assuming away innovation and related factors that dramatically alter industry characteristics. Now, one way of looking at dynamic analysis is to say it may emphasize how innovation may reduce costs, create new demand curves, new markets, new surplus, and basically fundamentally change business models. But that's uh, perhaps not all that common an occurrence. Quite more commonly, probably, dynamics may, may also refer to how uh, innovation reduces costs in existing markets, how it uh, may change perceptions of quality and change demand curves, how it may change also incentives to reposition, changes in, in industry uh, characteristics. Uh, through uh, the achievement of efficiencies of various sorts, product re repositioning, existing firms, incentives to enter a market. In some sense, the idea that all of these are dynamic elements because they refer to, uh, uh, 
changes over time and moving out of stable equilibrium, uh, changes in the char characteristics of demand and of, of supply and cost. And uh, so dynamic analyses, uh, again, don't necessarily involve product change. There's concern for new products and processes. It means that IP issues, which were alluded to at length in the first panel, may be very important because they're an increasingly important part of value added in lots of tra uh, transactions, including mergers. And uh, let's look at the next set of considerations. Now, what about merger guidelines? Uh, in an earlier presentation last month, I made the position that, took the position that although there certainly are sort of static elements to the analysis found in the merger guidelines, which have been revised steadily, the modern rate merger guidelines, 82, 84, 92, 97, uh, in, in reality, uh, the 2010 merger guidelines, I think it's the position of the agencies, make clear that in, in recent years, arguably recent decades, in fact, the, the uh, agencies have been looking at dynamic characteristics. And one thing that the 2010 guidelines, they spell out some of these dynamic elements. They say that uh, analysis should be fact-specific and fluid. I think People involved in mergers knew that already, but they spell that out in section one. They do away with a two-year time limit, specific time minute limit on committed entry in section nine. Uh, very importantly, and I won't say too much about the implications, but they explain that market definition is not a rigid deterministic procedure or end in itself and should be ex applied flexibly, and there's a notion spelled out of candidate markets and alternatives. And, and also very importantly, they specifically discuss the effects of a merger on innovation in addressing efficiencies. There is a new separate discussion of innovation, the efficiency section, and I won't uh, elaborate beyond that, but I, my basic point is I think already we see in the framework of the guidelines how dynamic considerations are going to be taken into account in a very general sense. And now let's turn to some of our expert speakers to see in a practical applied sense how dynamics and innovation have been taken into account. And again, we'll start with Professor Baker. Uh, thank you, uh, Alden, and, and good afternoon, everyone. I, uh, I believe I was on a panel at a law review symposium here a while back, maybe a decade ago, and I want to thank the law review for inviting me back after that performance. <laughs> uh, I have some slides, which I hope someone will put up while I start to talk. Uh, I'd like to begin with some uh, historical context uh, about antitrust and, and innovation. Around 1980, it was uh, um, hard to know uh, what to say about, about the relationship between antitrust and innovation. There was a uh, theoretical controversy about whether competition favored innovation, that was the a view associated with Kenneth Arrow, and, uh, and, uh, or whether monopoly favored innovation, which was associated with uh, Joseph Schumpeter. The empirical literature seemed to show that moderately concentrated industries uh, were the most innovative, not the not the not highly concentrated markets or unconcentrated markets, uh, but it was sort of it was called an inverted U, uh, and neither theory nor empirics circa 1980 offered a clear resolution of the controversy of the relationship between market structure and innovation. So many antitrust commentators reserved judgment um, and um, about whether antitrust, you know, which protects competition, is in fact good for innovation. Now, 30 years later, the, uh, the landscape has changed. Um, economic theory now recognizes uh, uh, a number of uh, important mechanisms uh, relating competition and innovation. Uh, and I'm going to mention four, which will show up on a slide whenever we get around to it. Uh, two that encourage innovation and uh, two that discourage it. Um, so do I do something yet? Oh, someone will tell me. Uh, so, uh, first, competition in uh, innovation itself. Uh, oh, okay, that's good. Let's see what we do. Uh, that's not what I wanted to do. Let's see. OK, 
Okay, now how do I advance the slide here? Someone have a theory? Yeah. No, that wasn't it. Let's see. Ah, there we go. Okay. All right, here we go. So, uh, I got it. <laughs> okay, so uh, um, I'm beating you, Keith. Are you still here? <laughs> he has to learn about Google, but I got this one for him. <laughs> first, uh, first competition in um, innovation itself, you know, that is, you know, competition to develop new products or processes unambiguously encourages innovation. And second, a firm that's uh, facing competition in products today, now, now we're not, not, not shifting competition to innovation, but sh competition in products, uh, has an incentive to develop new products, new production processes in order to escape that competition. Um, make something cheaper, make something newer and better. The third, uh, 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 I'm down here on discourages now, uh, is uh, uh, the, the, the point, the third mechanism is the flip side of the second one. If innovation won't let a firm escape competition, but will instead throw an innovating firm into a pool full of sharks, the, you know, the aggressive rivals, uh, the firm has less incentive to innovate. And the fourth mechanism, which is the preemption incentive, is a corollary of that last uh, uh, one. That it says firms that uh, can discourage rivals from innovating through their own investments in R&D. And the modern empirical literature largely supports these four different theoretical mechanisms. The old inverted U could simply be a, a, a statistical artifact of of uh, imperfect controls for industry di differences in technological opportunity or appropriability that had nothing to do with market concentration. And the modern studies tend to find greater product market competition encourages firms to escape that competition uh, through innovation and also the, the preemption, uh, preemptive R&D investments point is supported. But even with the modern uh, understanding of the relationship between competition and innovation, it might still appear we ought to reserve judgment uh, about whether increased product market competition and thus antitrust enforcement is good for innovation. On the one hand, increased product market competition encourages firms to innovate to escape that competition. And on the other hand, the anticipated post-innovation competition uh, discourages innovation. And it might seem that uh, increased product market competition could be good or bad for innovation on balance. But that analysis doesn't end the story because antitrust is not a general purpose competition intensifier. It's a targeted tool. It targets types of industries and types of conduct. And in doing that, uh, antitrust promotes innovation competition, pre promotes pre-innovation competition without making that much difference to post-innovation competition. And so it promotes innovation overall. So for examples, I'm going to turn to the specific subject of our panel. Uh, using horizontal merger enforcement to increase competition in current product markets. Uh, that's unlikely to chill innovation because firms don't generally innovate with the prospect of a future horizontal merger as the expected payoff. If you told startups or innovators they could not merge with their horizontal rivals, they'd still uh, likely have the ability to merge with a firm that produces complements or license a new idea at an early stage to a horizontal rival because antitrust is more hospitable to uh, those kinds of tra uh, transactions. And if a later horizontal merger were proposed uh, and it would generate substantial efficiencies, uh, the antitrust enforcement would take that into account too. Uh, um, the two recent mergers I'm going to talk about in a, a little bit of detail uh, uh, show that a focus on dynamic competition, innovation, and the possibility of unknown future rivals uh, does not mean antitrust should give high-tech firms a free pass. We need antitrust because of innovation, and we need product uh, competition and innovation competition in order to foster innovation. So that's the big theme. And then in the remainder of my time, I want to talk about two mergers. Oops, wrong direction. Uh, two recent government merger reviews and show how competition uh, policy protected innovation incentives in each. Both involved concurrent reviews by the Justice Department and the Federal Communications Commission, and I worked on both for the FCC, so I'm going to emphasize the FCC's analysis in, in what I have to say. And I ought to sa add, since I gave it that setup, that I'm just expressing my personal views and not uh, those of, of uh, the, uh, the Federal Communications Commission. So the first line of the slide uh, sketches a stylized version of the, uh, of the uh, Comcast NBCU transaction, NBC Universal. Uh, it describes the transaction as a vertical merger between a video distributor, uh, which is Comcast, and a content provider. 
And it highlights one competitive effects concern, namely input foreclosure. Now, the transaction is really more complicated than that. It also has a, or had a horizontal com uh, component. It was technically a joint venture. There were additional competitive effects concerns, but I'm putting all of that aside uh, uh, because this is what's going to, we'll start with the input foreclosure issue and that'll get us to the, uh, the, um, the innovation uh, and, uh, or the high-tech uh, uh, changing industry uh, uh, aspect of the deal. So the input foreclosure concern was that Comcast would harm um, uh, MVPD rivals, multi channel video programming distribution rivals uh, within its cable footprint uh, through exclusionary strategies that mainly involve NBC's uh, marquee cable networks, which were highly valued by subscribers. The, uh, and uh, the rivals within the uh, Comcast footprint might include, uh, for example, Dish, DirecTV, Verizon, cable over overbuilders might vary at different locations. Those are, those are the MVPDs that we're talking about. Uh, and exclusion here ought to be understood broadly. Rivals might be excluded if Comcast withheld programming, either permanently or temporarily. Uh, but they would also be excluded if Comcast simply raised the price it charged for NBC content. The FCC concluded that these strategies would be profitable for, for Comcast after the merger and would harm competition and consumers, and supported that conclusion with uh, economic studies. Um, uh, one of them analyzed the profitability of withholding uh, programming. Another analyzed the effect of the merger on the bargaining between Comcast and a rival MVPD over the price of uh, programming. And a, and a third analyzed the consequences for programming prices of a previous example of vertical integration uh, between an MVPD and a content provider. That's the Fox DirecTV example on the, on the screen. And these analyses accounted for efficiencies arising for vertical, for, from vertical integration, including uh, the elimination of double marginalization. Now, the innovation issue in the, in the uh, merger review involved the possibility of a future competition from online video distributors. That's the OVD on the, on the screen. Uh, online video distributors that are not MVPDs. So these OVDs might include, for example, Hulu, Netflix, Google TV, and iTunes, but it could also be other firms that we have not heard of or have not yet uh, been invented. Uh, there's a great deal of uncertainty today as to which OVD business models and which firms w uh, would succeed. The FCC viewed the um, OVDs primarily as potential rivals. Uh, though there are, they are to some extent rivals already. Uh, and the FCC concluded that if Comcast would exclude um, MVPDs, it would have a sim if, it would, if, it would, if it would exclude MVPDs through input foreclosure, you know, the, the uh, uh, Verizon or Dish or uh, those, those firms, it would have a similar ability and similar incentive to hinder the development of OVD competition through input foreclosure by withholding NBCU programming or charging a high price for it, uh, again, harming competition uh, and consumers. So to protect uh, future online video distribution competition without uh, prejudging what business models would succeed, the FCC, by its decision, and then the DOJ simultaneously and in a coordinated way through a consent settlement, adopted conditions to ensure that the OVDs would retain non-discriminatory access to uh, NBCU programming uh, so most importantly, uh, if an OVD enters into an arrangement to distribute con content that was created by, uh, by uh, NBC's uh, peers, like a programming deal with CBS or Disney or could be many others, content uh, has to make comparable programming available on non-discriminatory terms, and all this is enforced through a baseball-style arbitration. So my final slide here. Uh, is is uh, about the AT&T T-Mobile transaction, and my discussion here is based upon the uh, uh, FCC's staff report. Um, the proposed merger involved two of the four <coughs> retail mobile wireless service providers that have Spectrum and Towers uh, in most of the hundreds of geographic markets nationwide that cover more than uh, collectively more than 90 percent of the U.S. population. Uh, you can think of national market shares as averages across all local markets, uh, sort of a, a roughly kind of what it's like in the typical market. The top 
four firms, uh, AT&T, T-Mobile, Verizon, and Sprint accounted for 87% of subscribers and revenues nationally. The deal would have combined a firm with uh, a 30% national share and a firm with an 11% uh, share. Uh, so the transaction would have increased concentration in an already concentrated market. We don't have to work out the HHIs to see that. T-Mobile was a uh, disruptive competitive force in pricing and, and uh, more to the point in, uh, for this discussion, also in innovation. Uh, for example, it was the first uh, provider to, to deploy a technology for high-speed wireless service aggressively through its network. That's the uh, HSPA Plus uh, uh, technology. And it caused AT&T to, to accelerate its own deployment. Uh, it was also a founding member of the alliance that helped bring Android handsets to the market and was the first provider to offer an Android smartphone. So the FCC's uh, extensive staff analysis, which I can barely do justice to in, in a quick uh, summary, um, explains the loss of a disruptive rival in concentrated markets is a recipe for coordinated effects. Uh, Verizon and Sprint would likely go along. Verizon would almost surely do better by coordinating than uh, competing aggressively. And Sprint could also experience a higher cost of expansion because of the potential for exclusionary conduct involving backhaul, handsets, and roaming. And the staff was also concerned with uh, unilateral effects, the loss of an independent T-Mobile brand uh, as an alternative for AT&T's customers would likely lock in more customers to AT&T, making AT&T's residual demand uh, uh, less elastic and leading it to raise price unilaterally. And you'll, you'll, the, uh, it would, some Verizon and Sprint uh, customers would also lose their second choice, and, and so for the same reason, those firms would also have a unilateral incentive to raise price. Entry and repositioning by small rivals, regional providers, Clearwire, or Light Squared, uh, you know, the, 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 the universe of, the, of the, the firms that people talk about, would not solve these competitive problems, according to the FCC staff. Uh, the investments these firms would need to make in services, facilities, marketing, business model development to constrain AT&T's pricing are, are just too great and would take too long. But what about the efficiencies? So AT&T had a plausible sounding story about the costs and difficulties it face, faces in serving exploding uh, data traffic with its existing spectrum. Uh, and its engineers built a model to quantify the cost savings it could obtain by adding T-Mobile's spectrum. Uh, its economists relied on that output of the engineering model uh, in creating their analysis of the economic impacts of the merger. Now, the engineering model had a number of problems that led the FCC staff to conclude uh, that its assessment of the cost savings was uh, overstated and unreliable, um, and that there was no evidence that the efficiencies, however plausible in principle, uh, were in, a, in practice of, the, the, of a magnitude that would be necessary to eliminate or outweigh the competitive concerns. Uh, the model's uh, cell splitting algorithm was one of the major problems. Uh, the engineering model identified uh, locations where growing data usage would create congestion. And then it presumed, plausibly, that AT&T would seek to address that congestion by building additional cells. But the model was uh, specified in a way that assured that most of the cell splits that would be needed wouldn't actually take place in the specific sector locations where the congestion was occurring. They it would actually increase, they, they would split cells, but somewhere else. So the sectors would remain congested, leading AT&T to turn to a more expensive technology to address the problem. Uh, the result is that the model inflated the costs that AT&T would experience absent the merger, and as a result, inflated the likely cost savings that it would get relative to the world but for the merger uh, you know, through the transaction. So when the FCC corrected this problem and, and some, but not all, of the other problems it identified, the, it found that AT&T's own economic model of the effects of the merger no longer predicted a price decrease, which was the, you know, the claim, uh, but instead would predict a price increase. And so the upshot is that the uh, FCC staff recommended that the commission designate the, uh, the merger for an administrative hearing. Uh, AT&T then withdrew its merger application before the FCC decided whether to act on that proposal. And three weeks later, it gave up on the transaction uh, and dropped its litigation with the uh, Justice Department. So the, uh, what these two transactions show uh, is how competition policy enforcement accounts for 
um, uh, uh, the dynamic issues, efficiencies, innovation, and the possibility of uh, unknown hypothetical future rivals in the review of mergers in innovative industries. Uh, and so I want to return to my uh, big theme from the, big, from the start, that antitrust enforcement is essential in order to protect the incentive that competition confers in encouraging innovation. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much, John, for uh, that very interesting uh, summary of two highly publicized transactions. Just before turning to Tom Haz, I've just got one question, and, and I confess I know no more about the transaction than what I've read about on, in the trade press and Truth on the Market, which uh, uh, is a blog known to some. And, and there were some trade press reports that additional arguments made by AT&T included, look, as concentration has gone up in mobile markets, prices have been, a secular trend has been falling prices, and look, T-Mobile is looking to exit the market, it's going to sell its spectrum to someone, if not to AT&T, to another major player, so, because it's, it's not going to remain in the market. You made the point that it was sort of a, if not a maverick, at least maverick-like disruptive force. To what extent were those sorts of arguments that we see in the trade press considered uh, to your knowledge in, in looking at the merger? Uh, so um, uh, the exit argument, I mean, there, there was no argument that T-Mobile was a failing firm. Uh, and uh, you're not, in, you know, you can decide to exit the market, and, uh, but that doesn't mean that the assets have to exit the market. And it doesn't mean you have to sell to a firm that, uh, to sell to, to a firm that would uh, be able to exercise market power. Uh, so, uh, um, you know, the, the certainly got thought about, but it was not particularly an influential uh, uh, argument, I wouldn't say. Uh, well, the other one was... Um, about the secular the trend of falling oh, yeah, yeah, prices yeah. and as concentration rose okay, in some I, markets. What I don't rem uh, let me see, if I'm, I hope I don't get into the redacted part of the thing. Of the <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I believe that there is a, a statement in the unredacted part of the... Uh, of the uh, staff report that says something to the effect of uh, th uh, that there's evidence that within this industry, um, uh, uh, AT&T recognized uh, that, uh, in fact, that um, greater concentration leads to uh, higher prices. But I, I won't say more about it than that, because I think that's about as far as the, the staff report says. So in other words, that, um, uh, you know, potentially this could be, you know, it's potentially relevant evidence, but the evidence doesn't point the way that, necessarily the way that you're describing. Okay, well, th thanks very much, John. Very, very interesting. Now, Tom Hazlitt, who I know has spent a lot of time looking at communications industries and information industries, is uh, uh, going to give us his observations. Tom? Uh, thank you. Uh, I have no PowerPoint, so if I sweat heavily, I'm trying to go cold turkey just off the PowerPoint completely now. <laughs> you may have to take me off on a stretcher. Anyway, it's uh, uh, nice to be invited here, and I uh, appreciate the, being on this distinguished panel. And following uh, Professor Kovacic, which is a difficult task, being sandwiched between Kovacic, who's like the Bette Midler of competition policy. Everything sounds interesting, exciting, and melodious. And then Bruce Kobayashi, who might be the Darth Vader of competition policy. Yeah, it's depressing just to think that he's going to go next. Anyway, um, um, uh, I've known and loved Bruce for a long time, so that's what you get. Anyway, I love the suggestion of uh, Kovacic's at lunch about uh, more uh, ad hoc socialization between the caseworkers talking things up. It made me think of uh, uh, Stephen Jobs when he, he was a fanatic about this, the idea that these uh, interminglings, uh, spontaneous uh, uh, meetings in the hallways, you know, are very productive. And when he was designing uh, with meticulous micromanagement, uh, as he was wanting to do, was designing the uh, new headquarters of Pixar in Emeryville a few years back. Uh, it was a massive building with a, 
uh, nearly as massive atrium in the middle of the office. And uh, he, he uh, specifically designed it so there would only be two, one male, one female, bathrooms at one extreme end of the building so that people would have to walk past each other and then go to the same bathroom. And uh, there was a uh, mini revolt from uh, the pregnant employees of uh, Pixar who insisted that walking this long distance would not be in their uh, physical capacity. Uh, capacity, so uh, they actually put in two bathrooms as the compromise. Anyway, I've never been much for bathroom networking myself, but uh, Steve Jobs is way ahead of me on these uh, strategic issues, so um, uh, I'll have to defer. Um, so um, the topic is, uh, uh, you know, tech uh, mergers in the, in the tech industries, and uh, when you're talking about technology, presumably you're talking about dynamics. And uh, that takes us from the uh, uh, standard uh, static, uh, sometimes called textbook models of competition, uh, into a little different framework. And um, uh, both Alden and uh, Jonathan are insisting that the uh, antitrust agencies, and uh, I think also uh, by reference the Federal Communications Commission, are perfectly aware of dynamics. Um, uh, things have gotten better since the Federal Trade Commission looked at Kodak uh, perhaps as the uh, paradigmatic uh, monopolist, um, but uh, I'm going to demur on that. I, uh, I look at some of these mergers that are coming up to the agencies now, and I see that the agencies really are just absolutely flummoxed uh, by uh, real dynamic competition. Yes, it's true that regulators can count to four, but that's the static analysis, and certainly in what we've just seen uh, coming down, um, uh, we, we see regulators grappling with dynamics. Uh, Oliver Williamson showed us how to uh, you know, in a simple formal way, try to take some uh, efficiencies into account. Even that's controversial, the idea that uh, if you're changing some uh, investment costs or uh, average costs, that that should be considered right along with uh, something that is demonstrably a marginal cost savings. Uh, even that is controversial, which shows you, I think, how uh, stuck in the static model the, uh, uh, you know, the, the analysis is. It's, a, it's absolutely essential to, incur to, to these industries that investment, that innovation, and creative destruction be allowed and uh, uh, encouraged to be supported uh, with public policy. So uh, all of the things that come up in mergers that are really interesting really are uh, about dynamics. So a couple of examples uh, might get to what I'm talking about. So in 2007, we had two uh, uh, satellite radio firms announce a merger, XM and Sirius. And, um, uh, it's nice to mention this because the merger has been consummated. We've seen the effects. Uh, the merger was um, uh, strongly opposed by the uh, terrestrial radio broadcasting industry. Uh, that alone provided a factual basis on which the agency should have been able to see some dynamic efficiencies for allowing this merger to go through. By the way, it was a two to one merger, not a four to three, a two to one. Two satellite radio companies merging to become one satellite radio company. And yet it was uh, uh, certainly, without question, efficient for that to happen. And um, uh, that, that evidence was, was adduced in a number of ways, uh, but the agencies had real trouble with it. Now you say, well, they, you know, they approved it. Well, it took 13 months for the Department of Justice to approve it. And how did they approve it? Well, they approved it by saying that the, the uh, XM and Sirius were in different markets. This was the lead argument. XM and Sirius primarily marketed their services uh, through automobile. Uh, companies where you buy a new car and you get satellite radio service and that these contracts went some number of years, three to five years, I'm uh, doing this from memory, uh, but because these contracts were quote unquote long term contracts that uh, the companies really didn't compete against each other in the, in the short term time frame uh, of three years or so that the, uh, the antitrust uh, analysis was aimed for. I couldn't believe that this was the uh, the rationale, the merger should have gone through, but uh, to say that they don't compete because they're not in the same market is, uh, you know, it's a punchline to a joke if you're telling somebody who's not an antitrust lawyer. Antitrust lawyers think this is a very sophisticated argument. And in fact, I'm sure that the Department of Justice was proud of itself 
for getting enough into the case that they understood that these contracts with the uh, automakers were important and they were showing off a little of their industry knowledge by saying that this was the basis on which they were going to allow the merger to go forward. The real reason, of course, for the merger is that there are a lot of dynamics in the industry. The industry is uh, broadly construed much past satellite radio. Uh, certainly terrestrial radio is a competitor uh, and uh, MP3s and uh, internet radio and uh, uh, many other uh, forms of uh, including now HD radio, many other forms of uh, uh, audio competition. So um, that was just too difficult to deal with. Uh, it took 13 months. By the way, that didn't get the merger done. It took another four months, four and a half or so, for the Federal Communications uh, to consider this. And they extracted a pound of flesh and some merger conditions that actually took capacity out of XM Sirius to subtract some of their market power, their alleged market power, and uh, gave it to a private equity firm that uh, uh, had convinced the chairman of the FCC that they uh, should be allowed to compete with part of the capacity uh, of uh, XM Sirius with XM Sirius. And so um, that, that deal was done, and uh, the company before too long was in bankruptcy reorganization. I call it bankruptcy. They called it being saved by John Malone. Uh, uh, the, uh, the entrepreneur from the cable industry, those in the industry say the only thing worse than going into bankruptcy is to be saved by bankruptcy from John Malone. Uh, at any rate, they, uh, they had what is politely called a restructuring of equity and debt, and they're still there, they're still operating, and they're still competing. Uh, but they were uh, uh, a two-to-one merger, according to uh, uh, many who were opposed to it, uh, and it was all about dynamics and allowing uh, some efficiencies uh, to go into the market. Now, um, uh, talk a little bit about, uh, and I've got uh, probably about four minutes, uh, talk about the uh, uh, AT&T T-Mobile, which is the big, uh, certainly the big ticket item. Um, this is fascinating uh, for some of us because here you have the intersection between spectrum policy, uh, which is, uh, to put it mildly, overly conservative and uh, tends to starve uh, the industry of needed inputs, uh, the mobile industry, and, uh, and antitrust policy. Uh, to go back a few years, uh, the United States uh, was doing its typical uh, regulatory lag thing uh, between 1994 and 19, well, 2005, essentially, 2006. And during that entire long decade where there was no new spectrum allocation, despite the incredible growth of wireless telephony, uh, U.S. mergers engaged in a uh, merger wave. And in 2004, you had uh, Singular uh, acquire AT&T Wireless, a company that's now called AT&T. And you had, in 2005, uh, Sprint acquire Nextel. As soon as those mergers were consummated, uh, both companies undertook very ambitious upgrades of their networks from uh, what's called 2G, second generation uh, narrowband uh, data services, to 3G, third generation broadband data services. And the mergers, in fact, did uh, convey capacity, no matter what the cost models at the FCC proved uh, about uh, cell splitting. The fact was that as soon as that, that extra spectrum came to those firms, they upgraded their national networks and a 3G competition broke out. The United States, despite uh, uh, never putting out those 3G licenses that, by the way, went out in the European countries in 2000, 2001, uh, today, because of liberal policies and because of the merger way, we actually have higher 3G penetration in the United States today. Uh, than our major European uh, competitors. Um, now, this, 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 was a, uh, this was in some ways an unfortunate way to plug the gap uh, that was created by the regulators, but it was the way that actually worked in the market. And then you fast forward now to the transition to 4G, and the same thing is happening. By the FCC's own numerous uh, pronouncements, studies, reports, and even the, uh, uh, the um, attack, the report that was put out on the merger and uh, moved to block it, uh, the FCC maintains that companies need more spectrum to expand. And in fact, the argument they have against the AT&T T-Mobile merger is it tends to take away uh, spectrum from some smaller competitors. Well, the same argument works for AT&T itself. It needs more spectrum to expand. And so the, the, the real arguments put forward were too cute by half by the FCC. If they had gotten to court, they would have been in trouble. I don't believe that they were uh, terribly compelling. but. Um, uh, but certainly the process itself uh, is fairly non-transparent, so non-transparent we can't even hear what the evidence is because it's redacted, but uh, it's non-transparent in a much larger sense in the fact that it doesn't have to go to court and, and uh, get this thing worked out because of the transactions costs that are immediately imposed upon merging parties. 
At the end of the day, you had a merger, or a, let's, let's, let's take it from the, the German perspective. You had, a, you, had a, you had a sale of a company for $39 billion. That was T-Mobile being spun off by uh, the Deutsche Telekom. Deutsche Telekom had paid over $60 billion for those assets in 2000, 2001, that period. So a decade later, and by the way, they had not been looting the assets. They had been putting money into the company. A decade later, they sold at a, uh, about a 33% discount, getting no return whatever on the assets. Somehow, the $60 billion investment in 2000, uh, was, uh, which was perfectly competitive, and there's no question about that. The agency certainly didn't stop the, uh, the acquisitions because uh, companies were put together at that time, VoiceStream and PowerTel. Um, th those, those acquisitions were fine at $60 billion, now the $39 billion sale is monopolistic. Um, the, the DOJ argument is simply that four to three amongst national networks, an, ass an assertion, <laughs> sort of a market definition doesn't even fit what the, what the FCC's market definition is or was, that, that if you go from four to three, it's automatically anti-competitive. And, uh, and they, they infer backwards from that to, you know, to create some, some project, uh, projections on what's going to happen to price. There actually is market evidence about this, but they don't look at that. First of all, there's profits. If there really is market power in here, and you're talking about coordinated or unilateral action, there should be some draw from the evidence in the marketplace. But in fact, the competitors that are there now are making nothing. Okay, so the best analysts look at AT&T and Verizon Wireless as break-even propositions and say that there have been serious losses at T-Mobile and Sprint. And there really is no big debate on this on Wall Street, this is, uh, or, or anywhere else for that matter. There are just no profits. And there were no anticipated profits from the merger. When you feel, if you look forward, you can look to share prices. And you can see that there were not uh, uh, new sources of profitability uh, towards uh, either concentration uh, itself or uh, uh, concentration to promote collusion. Um, so, um, so you really, um, uh, you know, need to take a look, I think, at some of these, uh, you know, uh, market, uh, pieces of market evidence uh, that give you some idea in, in, into the dynamics. Uh, the fact is that AT&T, by, by the FCC's own admission, AT&T was after more spectrum, and the spectrum is valuable, and it's productive, and when you take it away from the entrance or the competitors, the fringe competitors, that's going to be a competitive problem. But the reciprocal argument is even more true by the FCC standing uh, uh, market concentration rules, by the way, which they violated. Uh, they violated uh, without comment and without analysis uh, the standing rules about uh, uh, spectrum caps and so forth. Uh, this, this merger actually fits, fits nicely under those spectrum caps. But uh, they, they ratcheted them up implicitly, didn't have to defend this in court, and uh, you know, made it uh, virtually impossible in an administrative sense for the merging parties to go through. So. Um, uh, I, I think that this is really an ad hoc examination. I don't think that prices are going to be low. I don't even think the FCC really believes that prices are going to be lower as per uh, the merger staying together. It, uh, it is a problem for the market that there's not more spectrum out there. And uh, the way in which we've, we've gone about a very herky-jerk manner in issuing uh, bandwidth capacity to the market in the U.S. has special problems. We, we fragment the, the rights in a way that is uh, almost phenomenal to believe. Uh, other countries around the world might have five licenses, ten licenses. Uh, we have over 55,000 licenses in the market that are aggregated into what the, uh, the Department of Justice says is only four national networks. So uh, the FCC number is about 56,000. The true, true number is four, according to the Department of Justice. So, so yeah, it takes a lot of transactions cost to get, to get all that stuff put together in useful ways. And the networks are, um, are competing to try to do that. Uh, one, one to the other, prices are falling even as concentration increases, and uh, now there is this problem. The, uh, the transition to 4G is going to take more bandwidth, and the companies are uh, uh, striving to get it. The regulators, um, we could say scrambling, but scrambling, scrambling, scrambling in the regulatory world is different than scrambling in, in the private sector. So scrambling means uh, we hope to get something out in five years. Um, uh, I mean, that's the national broadband plan to have a five-year um, uh, a five-year five move to, to another 300 megahertz. How are we doing so far? Um, well, uh, well, nothing's come out, but uh, that's only been a little over two years. So, um, uh, yeah, it's slow that way, and companies try to react in the market. Now the, uh, the analysis, I think, that is done to stop some of this, uh, uh, you know, quest for bandwidth um, uh, says it does, uh, you know, takes a look at dynamics. I don't think it does. 
I think it really needs to look at the evidence that's out there. Thanks. Thanks very much. Very provocative, <laughs> interesting remarks, Tom. And I think it's teed up a debate after our next speaker will speaks, Bruce Kobayashi, an interesting debate on, on AT&T T-Mobile. Uh, and uh, before turning to Bruce, I'm going to ask a question, not ask for responses, but just something to think about. Uh, Bill Kovacic at lunch talked about the existence of, of multiple agencies who had an interest in uh, competition. The agents, the FCC and the Antitrust Division both do competitive assessments of mergers involving the transfer of licenses. Some commentators, Greg Sidak for one, have argued that only one agency should be doing a competition analysis. Again, I won't ask for any responses. It's just something to think about, and if we have time, we may address that question. But now let me turn to, to another uh, expert on uh, regulated industries, antitrust, communications, and a lot of other topics, Bruce Kobayashi. Bruce? Thanks, Alden. Um, so uh, Jim Cooper called me on Monday and said one, one of my co-author, Luke Frobe, had bagged out, so uh, would I do a panel on mergers? And I said, I haven't thought about mergers in 25 years. Um, and, and the reason is, is when I first got to the Justice Department uh, as a staff economist, one of the first things they put me on was a boxed beef merger. It was ConAgra Swift. And uh, we took the plant tour. And I, I actually have hunted. Um, you know, when I was younger, I, I had, you know, filled butchered animals myself. And I became a vegetarian for a long time after that plant tour. <laughs> and mergers make my head hurt. Um, and merger analysis, I mean, so I, I worked at the Sentencing Commission. Uh, and it, I, I, as, I, as I, Alden misspoke, I never was at the CA. I was at the U.S. Sentencing Commission. And it was an interesting thing, because they produced these. These are actually guidelines, unlike the horizontal merger guidelines. So, and there's no theory, so we're not applying optimal penalties a la Becker or anything in these things. It was a pure empirical approach. It was the wisdom of judges in 94 or 96 federal districts, and we just sort of ran regressions and imposed sort of mean and a small variation around the mean. And, and you look at it, and so, you know, you're thinking, you know, I forgot my wallet today, and I have to go out to dinner. You know, where should I get some money? I asked Hazlett, and he said, no, I'm not going to give you any money. You never pay me back. And so maybe I, I was thinking about robbing the, the Wells Fargo down the street. But, you know, you could actually go and predict, go to, you know, 2B, and you could say, okay, a bank. It's a level 20 plus 2 because it's a bank. And so that's 22, and that's 41 to 51 months. Right, you go back to the sentencing table, and you know, then, of course, there's, I'd probably get fired, and then there'd be the reputational cost of being a bank robber. And uh, then I read all of the pre-sentence hearing reports that were underlying the bank robbery guideline, and those guys were getting $750 and getting caught in the parking lot as the die pack seated and, and obscured their view, and they'd run into a telephone pole. So, <laughs> but these are real guidelines. They're empirically based, right? And I mean, they're, they're, I, they're not... Um, without criticism, and now they're, after Booker, they're they're no longer mandatory. But I mean, that's that's a guidelines process. And we somebody asked Bill Kovacic, you know, only at only at uh, George Mason does Bill Kovacic get attacked from the right. But uh, <laughs> it was always a, it was a, it was so easy. Um, y you know, you you have you have something like this, and then you compare the horizontal merger guidelines. And and he was saying, well, you know. How is this the rule of law? Well, actually, I have. I, I, I made these up this morning, right? Um, but, I, I mean, there's a problem. I, the, the analysis of mergers, and part of it, if you're thinking about it from, from the firm standpoint or even from a social standpoint, it's a predictive exercise, as is all law. Oliver Wendell Holmes, you know, has this famous definition of law, right? A legal duty, so-called, is nothing but a prediction that if a man does or omits certain things, he will be made to suffer in this way or that by judgment of the court or maybe judgment of the agencies. But it's a predictability exercise. And so this actually, you know, we don't know if, if, if you know, uh, you know to level 22, 41 to 51 optimally deters people from robbing banks, right? I mean, I, I, I left my gun at home today. 
Um, but, you know, I, I could actually look what the marginal penalty would be for actually bringing a gun rather than just doing a note job at the bank. This is all hypothetical. Um, <laughs> and, you, you know, it, it basically does, it's not, you, you just have to brandish it, and it doubles your sentence. You go, it goes up seven levels. And you're now into 80-something months to 90-something months. Right, so, but all those were based on, on empirical regressions, right? And uh, that's predictability, right? Uh, and we have this. And so I, I haven't looked at merger guidelines. I mean, I left. I've been here 20 years. And right before then, I was at the FTC. But uh, my going to the FTC, I mean, the one condition on going to the FTC was I, I didn't have to do mergers. I, I worked in the policy shop. And uh, before that, I was at the Sentencing Commission. So it's, it's really been 25 years since I've looked at merger guidelines. So I sat down last night, and, and I read them. And um, I, I was just struck by how they're not really guidelines. I, I think they should ship these over to the consumer's protection side of the FTC and, and think about some kind of deceptive titling or deceptive <laughs> advertising. <laughs> OK. That's, uh, so, you know, I, so as an economist, you think, well, what, what do we want to do for merger enforcement? And, you know, I, you know, my students are sick of this. Everybody's heard me talk is sick, sick of this. But, you know, we have this decision theoretic framework where we say, well, let's minimize the sum of the two error costs, right? Type 1 and type 2 errors, plus the direct costs of having such a system. I mean, Dick Posner has this. I mean, everybody... And, you know, Fisher and Land said the latter costs are type 3 years. I don't know if that, that's caught on or not. But, I, I mean, so you have this decision theoretic framework. And, and part of it really is, well, you know, the, the type 3 years could be very important because um, although in an audience like this, it includes antitrust consultants, antitrust lawyers, and future antitrust lawyers, the type 3 errors aren't really costs. They're called revenues, I guess. But uh, <laughs> from a society standpoint, right, you may want to just have a much simpler system. And, and what, what is striking about these is that how little guidance they provided, at least the old guidelines. I mean, th they actually took the market definition seriously. And they took you know, the 1800s, a highly concentrated market, I mean, sort of seriously. Right now, they basically said, "Look, these are these are maybe things you might want to consider, but not in all cases." And and so, what we've gone from really is sort of a at least some instances where you just use sort of these rules. Maybe they didn't fit. Maybe they're they're passe. Maybe they're they're um, a repudiated approach, the structural approach to to mergers. But at least they gave some predictability. Right. And we've gone to, you know, sort of fluid analyses and flexibility. And so the, the question that was asked of, of Bill Kovacic is, is, is apropos, is, is, well, you know, maybe, you know, we have these, and, you know, I was at the agencies, and they do a lot of work on these mergers. They spend a lot of money, and the parties spend a lot of money. Um, and, you know, maybe they actually get things right relative to just randomly stopping or allowing mergers through. But it could be that, you know, you'd be better off just doing things either randomly or just through simple rules. And the 2010 horizontal merger guidelines are really a step away from predictability, right? I mean, it's not complete in predictability. Obviously, you know, we, we have a, a very robust antitrust bar, and they give advice, and it's their job to figure out what these set of enforcers are going to do. But I mean, if you just look at the horizontal merger guidelines, there's very little in it that tells you how your merger is going to be treated. So, um, you know, I, I'd probably prefer the, the old merger guidelines, even though I'm not a structuralist, right? Um, so, um, and you have to think about, well, okay, so um, if, so I don't get pigeonholed as an anarchist, although uh, I will anyways. Um, <laughs> You have to think about when merger analysis through the agencies work well, right? And I'll give you know John Baker some props here because uh, uh, you know Staples Office Depot. I am now convinced that you know I mean when I first heard that they were having a uh, product market that included 
office superstores, you know, well, I, I, you can go buy pens at, you know, all kinds of places. I thought that was ludicrous. But what they did was, um, at least at the staff level, did a difference in difference analysis, right? And it really showed that, you know, if a Best Buy or a Walmart came in, right, really didn't have much effect on price. But when there was entry by a head-to-head -head Office Depot Staples, that was sort of the most, uh, that's where you had the most impact on prices. And so it turns out, sort of like the Sentencing Commission, right, it's an empirical-based approach. If you can find natural experiments and data that are on point, then actually the agencies probably could actually usefully conduct antitrust policy and, and uh, make decisions that are, are going to be rational. And uh, as long as the parties have the same information, they should predict what's going to happen. All right, so, uh, you know, I could be wrong. And um, in this case, it's, it changed my mind based on the empirics. How about dynamic innovation mergers? Well, the problem is, and, and, and John talked about, you know, sort of the Schumpeter arrow. In fact, I got that from his article and the inverted U relationship. But it's, it's not a relationship that you can apply in a specific case, right? And so, you know, maybe it says, well, maybe we don't want to do a structural model, right, because it's going to get things wrong, right? There's not a lot of empirical evidence about what the next thing is. I mean, everybody's, I, I was in my class uh, last night, and uh, my IP class, and I said, I was t talking about, um, I, I was at the, uh, a big conference room at Wiley, Ryan, and Fielding for, for a board meeting, and Jim Wallace was talking about, you know, the NTP BlackBerry um, case that he was counsel for NTP, and he, he was saying how it, it paid for all this, you know, this very lavish, um, conference room on K Street, and I, I remember that it was during the Obama administration, so it wasn't that long ago. And I remember all the angst about what happened, what would happen if NTP got an injunction and shut down our RIM, right? RIM, stock price of RIM today is $16 and change. At its peak in 2008, I believe, it was $150 a share. And I asked my class, I said, who, who has a BlackBerry? That's not a big class, right? But it's one guy. And he only sheepishly said, I, I, <laughs> everybody else had. So it, it's hard to sort of, I mean, innovation, I, I mean, maybe the, the, the quintessential feature of innovation is, is lack of predictability. And really, in merger analysis, is you're, you're really trying to figure out what's going to go on in the future in this hypothetical world. And if you don't have something that, that, that tells you empirically, um, we don't have much theory, it's, it's hard to figure out how you're going to do this in a, in a predictable manner. Uh, now, um, one issue is that, you know, in, in cases where the sort of dynamic innovation effects are positively correlated with the static ones, you could just go on business as usual and, and it'll, it'll be right. But, you know, there is this notion that, you know, a lot of times, Appropriability is necessary for innovation, so, so the innovation dynamic story is negatively correlated with the short-term static story, and then you get it wrong. And unless you come up with some more ideas about how to, to de determine which one applies in a given case, right, you're going to have trouble doing this analysis in a rational way. Right? And so that's really the challenge. Tom said, you know, I'm going to be depressing you. Well. I don't know. I, I don't know if that's depressing. That's just a challenge, right? It's, it's the same kind of challenge that we face in Section 2, right? Determining whether or not, you know, this exclusive territory, use of exclusive territories by some firm is pro or anti-competitive. It's hard to tell. Predatory pricing. It's always the same thing. But we're always faced with these issues where, in theory and in evidence, we are short in being able to do this on a case-by-case -case basis, ex ante. So, the agencies get them, and they spend lots of money, and the parties spend lots of money doing it. So the type three error cost is very high. Um, I, I, Dan Crane's here. I was at a, a um, terrific conference this um, last weekend in New York, and Dan had this point about efficiency. See, I actually even cited you, Dan. I didn't even know you were going to be here. 
So I wasn't going to plagiarize. But I, I mean, efficiencies are sort of a funny thing because uh, my colleague Tim Muir said, well, yeah, I, I mean, they're only mentioned in a, you know, in a pretext pretextual uh, manner in inframarginal cases, right? When you figure out what's going on, then you say, oh, yeah. Well, if you're going to let the merger through, then you say, oh, well, then there's these efficiencies. If not, you know, they're, they're dubious. And, and in innovation markets, really, that's going to be, in a lot of cases, a central issue. I mean, in the true innovation mergers, right, the Schumpeterian competition, it's not what the structure is or what the prices are in the short term. It's going to be what's in the long term. And, and it, as Dan pointed out in his talk, Right, the 2010 horizontal merger guidelines. I mean, you know, efficiency claims won't be considered if they are vague, speculative, or otherwise cannot be verified. And then you go look at research and development; they're potentially substantial, but are generally less susceptible to verification. Right, and so if you take Section 10 seriously, let's just throw them out. And that's not a new thing. It's not a post-Chicago thing. Here's Bork. Right? I mean, this is just the, should we do the Williamson trade-off? Bork said no, right? Because he said you can't do it. Posner was a little bit more optimistic. He said, look, I said back then, and I, I still believe it, I think that there should be no general defense of efficiency. And the reason is, is that, you know, all we have in these cases is going to be basically speculation flavored by hope. And that's really no way to make a rational decision. So maybe we raise the, the thresholds at, as the 2010 horizontal merger guidelines do, apply a safe harbor, and you know, big mergers that would have been efficient, those are going to be our type 1 errors. Less concentrated industry mergers that are anti-competitive, those are going to be our type 2 errors, and let's just save a lot of money. Not a good, so that, I guess that's the depressing thing. Like, I mean, it brings us back to the Bill Baxter era of antitrust where the antitrust bar shrunk. You, you know, you go to the spring meeting, it's really depressing. And, oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, John and Tom talked about uh, AT&T T-Mobile. Actually, I think th th this, of course, is not from the FCC or the DOJ. This is the, this is the ad, one of the ads from uh, AT&T. You know, historically, falling prices after mergers, yeah, of course, this is voice. I mean, nobody uses voice anymore, right? Uh, but, yeah, I mean, so I think that's what you were referring to with respect to prices. So, you know, this doesn't tell us anything, right? Because this is a difference in difference estimates, right? So you could just combine and say, you know what? This line would have been, you know, like this, right? And we would have gotten 4G. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have a stupid 3G H, HESPA plus phone. I'd have a 4G LTE phone right now, right? Uh, and so, you know, the, the real issue when you're trying to actually get good evidence about what the effect of a merger is, is you have to say, you know, I mean, compared to what, right? You have to figure out a baseline, and then you have to sort of figure out, okay, what's the marginal effect of the merger? So just because you see innovation or you see prices falling, you know, they could have pr fell faster, or they could have uh, increased innovation at a higher rate. So. That, that's really the problem we have. I mean, the Staples Office Depot had, you know, a, a difference in difference economic metric estimation, which allowed us to sort of at least do this natural experiment of, you know, you, you had lots of geographic markets, and some, some of them had entry by Office Depot into Staples markets, and you got to see what happened. And you said, well, we infer that, you know, what the merger will do will just reverse that, and, and that'll be sort of a proxy for the effect of the merger. Here we don't, we don't have this, we don't even have this after the merger occurs. Right? We don't have any natural randomly assigned experiment, randomly assigned uh, data. I mean, maybe you could think of something where, you know, we have a big wheel in the assistant attorney general's office and you spin it and then it comes up on the double zero. Well, just let that one go, right? Mm. And then, you know, we could use the data. But I mean, yeah. in a serious sense, what we want to do is really do a lot more of these retrospectives both on mergers that were challenged and not challenged and maybe at the margin. And, and you know, the, the FTC has done some of that. So, um, but I, you have to encourage that because otherwise we're just going to be working in, you know, the state of, of n no knowledge, right? Except for this very costly, you know, case-specific, unpredictable, 
uh, analysis where you know um, it all happens in secret, and it's very hard to predict ex ante. Yeah. Um, the last thing is, what evidence do we have? Well, we have stock market data. Now, the DOJ complaint, the FTC complaint, it was a, a, sort of an exclusion case. But you know, when I would, when I, I actually entered the DOJ during the Reagan administration, uh, and we still, you know, Doug Ginsburg was ahead, and we still had the Baxter rule, right? If if the competitor, you invited the competitor in, and he said, "This is a horrible merger," right? And the theory of the case was that, you know, four to three, it was going to soften prices, right? And they were going to the the, the uh, monopolizing the firms are going to engage in monopolizing conduct by raising price and, and lowering output. If you're the third firm in the industry, you benefit, right? That's a great thing, because you have a softer price umbrella, right, and less competitive market. And so, you know, Eklo and Weir and, and Stillman had these event studies, stock market event studies. You, you don't look at merging parties or the agencies. You look at, you know, people who are just trading to make money and see what they think of it. Now, they could be wrong. But at least this is some evidence, right? And stopping an anti-competitive merger should result in firms um, that um, the, the non-merging firms in the industry, they, they should be hurt by that, right? Because they were going to benefit from this price umbrella, and now the merger is no longer going to go through. Well, here's, um, this is both Clearwater and Sprint's reaction to um, the DOJ complaint, and of course, you see the opposite, right? The merger is more likely to be stopped, and, and Sprint and Clearwire surged. On the daily uh, stock market, this is a, a daily. Uh, on the day that the uh, um, AT&T and uh, Deutsche Telekom announced that they were abandoning the mergers, Sprint stock uh, surged again. So, I mean, whatever evidence we have, and it's not necessarily dispositive, it suggests that uh, at least the DOJ theory of the case, based on you know, traditional reduction of output and raise, raising prices, aren't borne out by, um, by um, the, the stock market event studies. So do I have prescriptions for antitrust? Well, I, I'm not saying that you know, we should act on prior. So depending on whether you know, John is talking about the merger or I am, you know, John would say, don't just stand there, do something. And I would say, don't just do something, stand there. But <laughs> you know, I don't know if you actually want randomized enforcement under the 2010 standard type of enforcement. It's really expensive. So you know, I, I guess if I have to say something, um, maybe we ought to think about trying to return to predictability. Now, maybe you want to spend money, like Bill Kovacic said, and improve things. Or maybe we just want to go back to a simple structural model. I know it sort of seems backwards, but at least it'd be more predictable. The errors would be more predictable, and then you know instead of you know paying a four billion dollar breakup fee, you know they could be putting a cell phone tower near my house so this thing would work at my <laughs> house. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Thanks, Bruce. Before turning, uh, I will allow John to appear to rebuttal since he was outnumbered two to one here on AT&T T-Mobile. But uh, before turning that, I, I noticed that Bruce said that uh, merger policy is speculation flavored by hope. And I'd remind people that when Pandora opened her box, the one thing which remained and did not escape was hope. Now, uh, interestingly, one, one more minor comment. The, uh, trying to predict the facts. Dennis Carlton, who in the last administration spent some time as uh, chief economist in the antitrust division, argued for more ex ante agency merger effects predictions combined with specific ex post retrospectives to see if the agencies had gotten uh, uh, the, their prediction right. So at least it suggests uh, some interest in saying how can we really determine, and this is raises the broader issue. There's some critics out there who said there's no way of really measuring the efficacy of merger policy. And to the extent it will be able to use or not uh, empirical tools to think more systematically about that, including ex ante and ex post predictions, perhaps that's something to be thought about. 
Given, however, the fact that this is in opportunity cost terms very costly and also prone to, to errors of various sorts, it may not be the ultimate solution, but it just to show great minds think alike, I think Dennis Carlton and a few other commentators have talked about the need to, 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 to measure the, uh, how accurate the agencies have been. Now let me turn to you, John, on AT&T T-Mobile and get uh, your comments. Thank you. Um, I think I have a choice of whether to fuss with Tom or whether to fuss with Bruce. And, but Bruce was actually said nice things about Staples and actually read one of my articles, so I think I'm going to mostly talk about Tom. <laughs> the, <laughs> the, um, the, uh, uh, so there are several points I'd like to, to, to respond to. Uh, one has to do with the, the transparency of the, of the process. So you all, the context is that of the vast majority of, uh, of, um, a of merger proposals you know, don't uh, are resolved quickly. Most of them are resolved uh, without a second request, and even when there is a second request, it doesn't always take that long, and uh, uh, and and it's not, and and uh, it rarely, you know, gets uh, uh, challenged and reviewed uh, in in the long, serious way that uh, this transaction was, and and uh, this transaction merited that review you know, for obvious reasons. Um, but what's unique about this process uh, uh, compared to the usual review process? at uh, DOJ or FTC is, is, is how very transparent it really was, uh, unusually so. And that's because of the Federal Communications Commission's simultaneous uh, review. The FCC's review is done as an administrative adjudication on a record. And the, um, you know, yes, uh, uh, you know, various uh, uh, filings uh, have to be, uh, you know, are kept confidential uh, to protect, you know, business uh, uh, secrets and the like. But uh, but there's so much more information about uh, uh, AT&T's views, the criticism of Sprint raised, and through the staff analysis, how the FCC staff looked at it than you ever see in a, in a DOJ or FTC proceeding. And we should be applauding the transparency of this process, not, not criticizing it. And of course, if, uh, if uh, uh, and of course, just you know, to put a finer point on it, AT&T always had the option of, an, uh, of uh, having uh, further transparency through uh, not one but two hearings if it wanted. It could, it could, it could, it could, have, it could have gone to court uh, uh, and, and, and answered the DOJ's complaint, and it could have uh, uh, chosen to uh, go through the administrative hearing that the FCC uh, uh, proposed. Uh, the, um, uh, so, uh, uh, so that's the transparency point. Um, I think that Tom mischaracterized the DOJ's position a bit on uh, uh, th their, their complaint wasn't very different from uh, how the FCC was looking at it. Uh, uh, they actually are, uh, were looking at it in uh, uh, local markets with, uh, and it, they said they had some sort of nuanced kind of version of uh, you know, national effects as well, but uh, there's local and national uh, both in functionally, but I think formally they were defining local markets. Uh, and, w and that's not so different from how the FCC described it, uh, and I just did, did today. The, uh, and uh, uh, their analysis was much more than just four to three. You know, and you got a flavor of, of how we looked at it uh, at the FCC in the staff report today, and, and they were looking at it in a comparably um, uh, rich way, not just looking at uh, concentration. So I don't think that's really right at all. As far as the spectrum cap, uh, that, uh, well, it was really a screen, not a cap. And uh, just because, uh, and it wasn't intended to, free, pre, free, uh, to prejudge a full competitive analysis, and in any case, the report points out that, uh, that uh, concentration was higher than the cap in lots and lots and lots of, uh, of, of local markets, uh, much more than ever before in any, in any transaction. Uh, uh, um, uh, but if you want to force the FCC to rely on the cap and look only to um, uh, uh, market concentration, I think you'd find a, uh, um, uh, support from Bruce, who wants to go back to <laughs> look, look at just concentration because it's so predictable. So um, maybe there's something to, the, to that approach. Um, the, uh, as far as um, uh, uh, the AT&T absolute, you know, need, Tom sort of said, well, uh, talked about uh, AT&T needing the spectrum to deploy LTE, uh, and the FCC staff report claims otherwise. So uh, uh, you, you can, uh, it says that uh, the standalone AT&T has sufficient spectrum for LTE deployment. So you, th there's an argument on the facts there. Uh, the, uh, and uh, it also said that AT&T was planning a robust rollout of LTE prior to the announcement of the merger. So uh, uh, 
And that's all in the unredacted uh, uh, discussion. Um, and then uh, I also wanted to say something uh, uh, briefly about the, uh, um, uh, what Bruce was arguing about the event studies and, uh, you know, and, and uh, uh, Bruce was really making, he was conflating two arguments there. Uh, yeah, I mean, making two arguments together. Uh, what one was uh, that, uh, that we ought to be cautious in, we ought to be concerned on emerging when rivals object was sort of was part of it. And then there's also that there's information uh, in the uh, reaction of the stock market that's, that's valuable potentially in evaluating the consequences. Um, and and the, uh, what I wanted to do is actually read a footnote from the um, FCC staff report that mostly addresses the first uh, of these, the, uh, you know, the what can you infer from the positions of parties, but at the very end it, it, it makes it common relevant to the, the second. So, I, and, and that's, and I'll stop after I read this. So, if the merger would re result in lessened competition and lead to higher prices, Sprint and other rivals to the merging firms might appear to benefit financially and for that reason not have an incentive to take the position that many, including Sprint, have advocated that the FCC should decline to approve it. We do not make that inference any more than we would infer that the merger allows AT&T to exercise market power from the fact that AT&T proposed it and would profit if that's the result. Sprint and other rivals could have incentives to oppose the transaction even if they thought it would lead to higher prices. They might, for example, not expect to benefit on net from an anti-competitive increase in price because the merge firm would take actions that would raise their costs or otherwise exclude them, as Sprint has argued in this proceeding. Or they might expect that their opposition would make it more likely that the commission would ultimately approve the transaction with conditions such as asset divestitures, divestitures that would favor them, which parenthetically is also a, a response on the event study uh, issue. AT&T, in turn, may have proposed the transaction out of the expectation of achieving market power that would harm consumers, the expectation of achieving pro-competitive efficiencies that would benefit consumers, or the expectation of achieving financial benefits or cost savings that would accrue to shareholders but not consumers. Hence, we cannot make a judgment as to motive without first analyzing the likely competitive outcome based on the facts in our record. Like any fact finder, we must rely on information obtained from interested parties, review that information, any omissions with care, and test its credibility, as we've sought to do here. We also note that our record contains information from a wide range of industry participants unavailable to any firm individually to the extent our protective orders keep it from, the, from uh, firm executives and then I might add, and not available to the stock market as well. For that reason, we may be in a better position to learn about competitive conditions than any firm individually. And I think I'll stop there. Okay, uh, I know we could, we could continue debating this back and forth for a while, but I'll, before turning to the audience, and I wanna give you time to questions. and, and Anybody have any very, very quick reaction? Uh, so uh, on, on this, on the complaint, the, the Baxter rule, I, I just mentioned that. I mean, I, I, I'm not relying on, on just the pure motive of, of Sprint. I mean, they actively opposed the transaction as, as soon as it was announced. But uh, I mean, there's lots of work on information markets. And in some sense, the stock market is just an information market. And um, so we're not just relying on I hope I didn't conflate the two points. We're not just relying on Sprint's motives. I mean, we're talking about what people in the market traded Sprint as. Um, on the issue of, okay, it, so the DOJ's theory really was a traditional um, merger for monopoly, reduce output, raise prices. You also have the possibility of merger for exclusion. Um, and that does sort of co uh, complicate things. Um, on the whole, you know, my only point is that we have sort of the very fact-intensive, expensive way of doing it, you know, which we don't have very good theory or, you know, evidence. It's all very speculative. So is the market, but it is at least some evidence that we have in real time about the, what, you know, a bunch of, I mean, it's the wisdom of the crowds thinks about what, what's going to happen. And uh, just based on the DOJ theory, it looks inconsistent with, um, their theory. If you want to go to an exclusion theory, you'd probably have to also look at explain Verizon, which didn't move it much at all, and, and it's a, a more complex issue. Um, Josh Wright, my colleague, has, has written about a lot of this on, on truth on the market, if, if you want to look at it. Um, there's a good discussion. It's not dispositive, but it is what information we have. Um, I, I'm not advocating going actually going back to um, structural rules. I'm just saying, in you know, might be the lesser of two evils. I have another plan for antitrust, but no. 
Well, let, let me. Can I say something? Oh, sure, sure. Very quickly. Yeah, just on Bruce. Bruce said that he had actually killed butchered animals. So, Bruce, I can kill a butchered animal. Uh, no, I uh, anyway. I said kill and butchered. No. He said you killed a butchered animal. I wrote it down. Uh, putting Is this on in, tape? Putting it in your personnel file. Um, the. Uh, so Jonathan uh, says that the, 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 the spectrum screen at the FCC was, was actually a real problem for the merging parties. Well, it was because in a non-transparent way, the FCC actually switched the screen. The last time they stated a screen explicitly and made some argument for it, uh, there was a one-third spectrum screen saying you couldn't uh, merge to get more than one-third of the available spectrum. The FCC was clearly on record in the national broadband plan and ever since saying there's 547 megahertz in the market for mobile. So you divide that by three, and you see where this uh, merger goes out in uh, 734 local markets, which is where the local market analysis was. And you get virtually nothing that's over the screen. Now, the FCC does say a lot's over the cap because they, they lowered the cap, and they did it uh, a little bit. They sort of backed in that in an earlier merger, and they didn't explain why. And You know, I mean, if, if this is transparent, then uh, we got real problems. It, it doesn't go to court. It doesn't get oversight. Um, and uh, it, 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 when you can lay the transaction cost on the merging parties just by saying we're going to schedule this for a hearing, uh, there's something wrong there. Really, there, there is no due process on this, and the FCC is not held uh, liable. And I just want to say in terms of the actual you know, profitability in the market, that's a key issue. Bruce is talking about what aspect in terms of investors betting on the effects of the merger, and you can see that clearly that Sprint was hurt by the merger. Um, th that is a competitive analysis that has to be taken into account. Overall profitability is also important. And what is never, you can read uh, all through all the analysis of DOJ and FCC, and you'll never get, a a and, a <laughs> and, and, and even, a even the annual uh, mobile market report at the FCC, and you'll never get any serious consideration of what the real competitive issues are in the industry right now. Okay, the, all the carriers are having a tough time making zero, as, as high as zero return, because the, uh, profit, um, uh, the profit stream has gone out to the mobile <laughs> ecosystems created by companies like Apple. And there is a real problem of appropriating returns by the carriers. And it's a classic, I mean, we saw this 100, 150 years ago in terms of small numbers competition, if you count three, four, five, however many competitors in the carrier space, uh, battling each other. Uh, they have low marginal costs. They, they price pretty aggressively against each other, and now in that space are coming these iconic uh, compliments that are draining, just, just absolutely draining rents from the industry. Okay, so Sprint is out there. They are a, a sick child out there right now, uh, and, and yeah, they have competitors like AT&T and, and Verizon, uh, but, but, but they're, they're, the, the real problem is, is Apple, and they finally got the iPhone. They need the iPhone. They committed to buy... 30 million iPhones, 30.5 over four years, for $20 billion, 675 apiece. That announcement was made last year, and the stock price at Sprint went down 10%. And the CEO said, we had to do it. Everybody wants the iPhone. <laughs> and everybody does want the iPhone. And that's where the rents in the, in the industry are going. And so the competitive dynamic right now is really has to be adjusted if you want to understand what merger structure and strategy of the firms uh, has to be. You have to put it in this context that they're all struggling to make a zero rate of return. And, uh, and, and that's, that's, that, is, that is hard. A lot, a lot of economists would say it's intractable and uh, it's difficult to deal with. But that's what the economics are. And that's why, you know, throwing stuff out on, on uh, you know, in, in the old standard, you know, structure way is going to be inherently problematic, and I think that's what's happened here. Okay, well, uh, I want to turn to the audience. I'll just mention there are a number of uh, law and economics people have said that there should be probably only one agency reviewing com communications mergers, DOJ, for competitive effects. Obviously, we see, I would implicitly hear a difference of opinion on that, with, with John uh, stressing administrative expertise. but. Let me turn to for questions. Very, uh, who has questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, microphone, please. Uh, what I have isn't really a question. It's more of a general comment about transparency coming from the FCC. 
Of my recollection in paying attention to the AT&T case going through last year was that AT&T actually announced it was going to withdraw their application in front of the FCC before the staff report was released. And I found the staff report to be very good reading. It was kind of bold, actually, and I appreciated the guidance that the staff review shared with everybody who watches telecom mergers. The FCC had not flatly turned down an AT&T merger, ever. It broke them up in the Department of Justice broke up AT&T in circa 1983. We then all watched the recombination of AT&T, the change of the cellular duopoly from a landline and a host of non-wireline carriers up into this growing sized carriers. The FCC never looking at one of these many domino type mergers and saying, no, you can't have it. The FCC was always, we'll fix it. You can't have those particular assets, but you can merge it. And this felt like the staff report was important and a good step for transparency. Okay. Questions, comments, additional questions or comments? Okay. Well, let me ask then. What about the argument, briefly, John and Tom and Bruce, that there should be all competition analysis should be carried out by the two federal antitrust agencies and that an independent agency, that is apart from the FTC, of course, should not be carrying out competition type analyses. Bruce, I suspect, let me finish with John, but Bruce or Tom, do you want to comment? Last time I was in this room was for an LAC event from Jim Miller's, I don't know what anniversary it was. It was a large one, but one of the papers they had was Bob Tolleson, Richard Higgins, and Bill Shugart talking about the benefits of competition between the agencies. And I remember my colleague, Tim Uris, when he and the Assistant Attorney General James tried to do collusion on fixing clearance that, you know, I mean, part of the problem was, you know, the rhetoric was, you know, you're the antitrust agencies, you can't be colluding. You know, I have no problem with competition. You know, you always have, I mean, you know, I'm a big federalism fan, as long as you could have choice of law. A problem with multiple agencies is that you can't sort of pick ex ante where you're going. It includes Europe, it includes the states, it includes, of course, private rights of action. And so, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think that in some sense having competition in the agencies would probably be beneficial, but, you know, I don't know how that would come out. I would probably want to do a natural experiment. But, I mean, I think that is going to be made moot by the fact that you're having all these other jurisdictions and you have global competition. So it's not just FTC, DOJ, but they're in competition with the EU and all kinds of other jurisdictions. And so, you know, I think that question is sort of no longer that big of an issue. I think, you know, really you're having multiple jurisdictions who regulate antitrust transactions, transactions through antitrust. And I think, you know, we really want to think about sort of all of these overlapping regimes in a more systematic way. Yeah, I'm in favor of eliminating the double jeopardy. You know, and, you know, John says that there is more transparency if you have the FCC doing things and putting stuff out for public comment and releasing some documentation. That's true. But that, on some of these things, for example, the staff report, I don't, you know, okay, you can call it transparency. It's a one shot. It was a free shot. It was a free shot to put it out gratuitously after the die was cast and there's no kickback on it. So that's like not getting to cross-examine the witness. And I should say in transparency, I did do some work for the merging parties on this and helped put them over the top. But, you know, so to me that I do not think the FCC report was at all compelling. I think that they were too clever by half. They, you know, if you got that in the court of law, you would be able to point out that all these 
you know, the, the, the burdens placed upon the, enter the, the competitors, the French competitors, would be a rationale for AT&T to get the, uh, the stuff, you know, the stuff to begin with. Um, and I, I also want to say something about the, you know, economics at the FCC. I think it's very disappointing. I think the agencies have a lot more expertise, and the, the stuff that I've seen from the agencies on, for example, vertical integration is a lot sounder. So j just picking up on what, you know, uh, John was saying before about uh, the uh, NBC Comcast merger and some of the uh, vertical foreclosure issues. Um, the, uh, you know, I want to say, where were you when we needed you? Twenty years ago, there was a, a problem with competitive entrance into the local cable markets getting access to programming. And there was some uh, remedy offered by, act by a statute. Uh, the 1992 Cable Act did have uh, a prohibition on refusing uh, for satellite distributed programming, refusing to uh, allow competitors uh, to get access to programming in the distribution. And I, I think that that may have helped some. Some people, I think, put a little too much emphasis on that and the emergence of um, satellite uh, television being a competitor to cable. But for whatever reason, that market has become a lot more competitive. The local cable monopoly rents are, uh, in essence, a thing of the past. That, between satellite, cable, and uh, telco TV, you've got a very uh, impressive emergence of competition there. And so the FCC looking at this today is actually on the wrong, wrong track. Um, the studies that have been done do not show vertical foreclosure uh, in the, uh, on the programming side, for example. Uh, I refer, for example, to the Austin Goolsby study that was wrongly cited in the Comcast merger. It does not show that there is anti-competitive conduct, absolutely the reverse if you actually read the study correctly. Um, and when you're, when you're doing these, uh, you know, these economic analyses, the merger guidelines and every other uh, policy uh, recommendation is to look at the trends in the industry and try to pick up the trends, the dynamics. Well, what are the dynamics in the industry? If there is, is anti-competitive foreclosure taking place in cable, cable operators that own programming are able to squeeze out their competitors, why has the general trend in cable been divestiture? Okay, you had the Viacom quite a while ago spinning off its cable systems, but more recently uh, you've had Time Warner spin off Time Warner Cable, and you've had uh, Hughes, the aforementioned, uh, excuse me, uh, DirecTV, um, uh, sp uh, uh, News Corp spin off DirecTV. Okay, so they're voluntarily divesting their, 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 their uh, integration. So it doesn't seem that there's a lot of anti-competitive conduct there that they're getting all these rents out of. But all of a sudden, this stuff pops up again in, uh, in Comcast uh, NBC, it's rather curious. So I think that the economics should, should be done once, and they should be done better, and that would be done at the agencies. John, 30 seconds. Oh, it's going to take me longer. <laughs> so <laughs> I, want, I need to correct Tom on two, two points and then answer uh, uh, all those questions. So the, the, the first is, of course, that if at t wanted to cross-examine the witness, it absolutely had the opportunity. It could have gone to the hearing. Uh, it chose not to, uh, which is fine, but... Uh, they put it out after the, they said they the, were going to withdraw. The, uh, uh, it's still... They, the, uh, they had the, the trial with DOJ. Uh, they could have pursued. The, uh, the, um, and second, uh, in the, 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 it's a detail, but it's an important one. The, the Comcast uh, study uh, uh, didn't rely on the results of Goolsby that Tom wants to contest. What it did was it took the methodology proposed by Goolsby and applied it to a new data set and analyzed it, uh, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and that's what was the part of the basis of the, of the analysis. But Goolsby found the, no anti-competitive foreclosure. And on the data that was relevant to the case, the F FCC uh, found there was. The, and then on Alden's question about concurrent jurisdiction, uh, two quick points. One is, uh, it's required by statute. The FCC has a public interest standard that requires it to look at all aspects of public interest, competition included, but also a host of other things like diversity of viewpoints and advanced uh, deployment, deployment of advanced services and much other stuff. So uh, if you don't like it, you're going to have to go to Congress to, to, to fix it. And second, it does have some advantages. Uh, the, uh, essentially, the FCC majors in communication while DOJ and the FTC major in competition. Uh, and it's hard for DOJ particularly to bring a potential competition case uh, and analyze that uh, uh, in, you know, in, under the antitrust laws, whereas the 
the communications uh, sector regulator can take a broader view of the industry and think about uh, uh, how potential competition uh, might matter uh, in a way that uh, DOJ can't. Well, thank you. I think we may be over our time. Is that correct, uh, Katie? Uh, well, first of all, thank you all very much for this excellent panel discussion.